Welcome to DD Brisbane and uh, to this session, which is Advanced Web Debugging with Fiddler. My name is Mehdi Khalili. I work as a senior developer for Redify. If you want to tweet about DDD Brisbane in general or this session in specific, you may use DDD Brisbane hashtag or Web01 hashtag. So this session is about advanced web debugging with Fiddler. Uh, I've got a blog uh, at www.medi-calorie.com and uh, on which I sometimes blog, post every now and then. And uh, infrequently, I also tweet on my Twitter account, Medi Calorie. If you want to send me an email, my email address is medi at medi, me at medi-calorie.com. What are we going to cover today? We're going to start with what Fiddler is and how it works. We'll have a look at alternative, tool, alternative tools to Fiddler. We'll go through Fiddler features and uh, the major ones, at least. We'll have a look at Fiddler Core and Fiddler Cap. And uh, if we get any time left, we go through a, the remaining features of Fiddler. Let's get started. I have to go a bit fast, so uh, bear with me, please, because we've got a lot to cover. <laughs> What is Fiddler? Fiddler is a web debugging proxy. It's like an HTTP proxy that allows you to kind of monitor your HTTP traffic and do some sort of debugging. It's free, it's not open source, and uh, it's got a rather large user base. If you're a web developer or a, a distributed systems developer or just develop upon, or if you're a housewife, you can use Fiddler. I say housewife. <laughs> <laughs> I say housewife because a while back I saw this video on YouTube about a, from a housewife, and she was actually using Fiddler to hack a uh, Facebook game, Flash game, because she couldn't get past a level in, in that game, and she used Fiddler to hack it, which was really entertaining to watch. So in a nutshell, Fiddler can help you uh, monitor your HTTP and HTTPS traffic and analyze it, and it also allows you to modify uh, HTTP requests and responses. So what is this HTTP? I'll just quickly go through this. HTTP is a networking protocol that sits on the application layer. It usually sits on top of TCP protocol, not necessarily. An HTTP communication is called an HTTP session. A very common example of an HTTP session is when you type an address in your address bar and hit enter, the browser goes and does a DNS lookup for the address that you've entered, finds the IP address of the server, creates a TCP connection to the server using that IP address, usually on port 80, and then creates and sends an HTTP request based on the URL and some of the other information that it's got from you. Then server receives the request, does some processing on it, usually maps it to a resource, which could be an HTML page, and creates and returns the response, the HTTP response to you. An HTTP request is composed of a mandatory request line, which is a one-liner, and then you got some optional header lines, an optional blank line, and a body. So an example of an HTTP request is this guy that I did. Uh, it's just to go to the Google homepage. You go to your browser. You want to go to Google. You submit a GET request on http.google.com.au with HTTP protocol with version 1.1. It specifies the host that it's google.com.au, and it provides a few header lines there. The third one says, keep the TCP connection alive so we don't have to create this TCP connection on every single request. And there are a fair bit there as well. And in response to that, Google gets the request, provides the status code, says, yeah, I got your request. The response is okay. I can return the page that you're looking for. And it returns a fair few other header lines as well and a body there that, that's the Google homepage. So let's get back, get back to Fiddler. Where can you get it from? You get Fiddler from Fiddler2.com. I usually just go to Google and search for Fiddler if I can type it properly. Um, I'll just try it again. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what's happening, but I'll come with a U. Anyway, it's not allowing me to go there. I don't Google it, I Bing it anyway. So we go to Fiddler. And the first hit is the Fiddler website. So on the Fiddler website, you can download Fiddler here. 
you can get some add-ons here. You can go through helps and documentation here, which is, which is quite extensive. So yeah, if you want to get filler, head to, not Google, Bing, and search for it. <laughs> All right, so how does Fiddler work? Fiddler is an HTTP proxy. In Windows, we've got WinINET and WinHttp. WinINET stands for Windows Internet, and WinHttp is very much like WinINET. It's <coughs> like a cut-down version of WinINET and provides a cut-down version of its API. So pretty much all the applications that send any HTTP requests, uh, do any sort of HTTP communication, go through WinINET and WinHttp, apart from a few like Firefox. So Fiddler f sits between WinINET and WinHttp and the outside world. And uh, every traffic going through these two libraries are funneled through Fiddler, and that's how it works. So let's have a look at it in action. So I'll just fire up Fiddler. I've actually already got it running there. So let's have a look at it. So the Fiddler is running now. I'll just stop it for a sec. When you bring up Fiddler, it usually starts up by default. If you have a look at WinINET options, this looks rather familiar. You can go to this uh, in Internet Explorer through Internet <coughs> Options or in Google Chrome. If you go to this guy here, Options, Proxy. So I don't have any proxy settings at the moment, as you, as you can see here. But when I fire up Fiddler, It goes and changes my proxy setting on WinINET, and that's how it gets to see all the traffic. So it sets the loopback address with this port here. So all the traffic going through Chrome and Internet Explorer and any other application is actually sent through this proxy where Fiddler is listening to. So if you go to Tools, Fiddler Options, Connection, it's actually showing you that it's listening on port 88, uh, 8888. You can change this port if you want to, but yeah. That's pretty much how it works. For Firefox and other applications that don't go through don't go through that proxy, WinINET and WinHttp, Fiddler has an add-on that allows you to funnel that, kind of force that traffic through Fiddler. So if you want to see how that works, so by default I've got this proxy setting here. For Firefox, this is for a client that I'm working on at the moment. And if I go to Firefox, actually, you can install this Fiddler too. You can force traffic to Fiddler. And when you do that, it does the very same thing that it does with Internet Explorer and Chrome and other applications. It just sets loopback address there, so the traffic in Firefox is funneled through Fiddler. So let's have a look at. So Fiddler is a web proxy. As we saw here, it's actually a Windows application because it's kind of tightly coupled to WinINET and WinHttp. So you can't really install it on Linux or Mac or other platforms. What you can do, however, because it's a proxy, you can set your proxy setting on your platform to send the traffic through to Fiddler. So you can install Fiddler and set it up on the machine and then set up proxy setting on your Linux machine to send the traffic to that machine on port 88. 8888 or whatever port that your filler is running. If you don't want to do that, there are some alternative tools that run on other platforms as well that we'll have a look in a second. All right, let's have a look at alternative tools to filler. We've got packet analyzers, or some people call them packet sniffers or network sniffers. We've got Wireshark and Microsoft Network Monitor, or as some people call it, Netmon or MS Netmon. These tools uh, sit on your network card and show you all the traffic that's going through your network card, regardless of the protocol and the process and whatever else. So it shows you every single packet sent through your network card. It's very useful when you want to do some low-level debugging. Like a while back, I was doing a Kerberos double hop issue uh, troubleshooting, and I just, couldn't real, I just couldn't find out what was wrong. So I fired up Netmon, and it showed me what was going on with that. Then on a higher level, we've got proxies like Fiddler. The alternatives to Fiddler are Charles and Web Suite, which are Java-based, and you can install them on all the other platforms. So if you want to use a proxy on other platforms, you can use Charles and Web Suite. And then we've got browser web tools like HTTP Watch, Firebug for Firefox, and DevTools in Chrome and IE DevTools and for IE. The IE DevTools in IE9 and IE10 uh, 
it's getting very close in, uh, from the functionality point of view to Fiddler. And that's because Eric Lawrence, who's writing and maintaining Fiddler, actually works as product manager in IE DevTools. So if you're using IE for your, as your browser, you have a good chance that you don't actually quite need Fiddler. But there are some differences that I'll explain in a second. So what's the difference between sniffers and proxies and browser dev tools? As mentioned before, sniffers uh, sit on your network card and they monitor and show you all the traffic that's going through your network card. So it's not HTTP only, it's all the protocols, all the processes. While proxies and browser tools are HTTP only, they only show you the HTTP packets. And because of that reason, they can provide a very nice visualization for your HTTP packets. But sniffers, because they're kind of like this generic tool that show you all this traffic, they can't really show you a very nice visualization. A similarity between sniffers and proxies is that they show the traffic from all processes. They're not bound to a specific process. But the browser dev tools are, specific, are running in a browser session. So they only show you the traffic going through that session, that particular session. And you can say that's actually showing you the traffic going through a browser tab only. So even if you have multiple browser tabs, it doesn't show you all the traffic going through the browser, only that tab. The last two differences are actually quite interesting. So sniffers work with this protocol called PCAP, which stands for packet capture. And uh, PCAP is implemented in Linux and Unix in a library called libpcap. And that's been ported directly to Windows in a library called winpcap, which we all know. WinPCAP doesn't implement loopback in interface, which means that the traffic going through your local host is not actually monitored. So if you've got some traffic going through your local host, or if you're trying to debug something on, on your machine, you're not going to get anything out of your sniffers. While with proxies and browser tools, you can actually see the entire traffic. And if you've got some cache traffic in your browser, if, you, if your browser has cached something and is serving something locally, if you've got a, an image or something that your browser knows can serve locally because the cache hasn't expired yet, it's not going to hit the network to get that. It just serves it locally, which means that your proxy and your sniffer is going to miss on that traffic. So you're not going to see any HTTP communication for that, for that request and response. What you can do, if you can't see that, you can do Control F5 in your browser that clears cache for that particular session, and you get to see the traffic going through that. Let's have a look at Fiddler features. That's when the action starts. HTTPS traffic, as mentioned before, an HTTP, an HTTP traffic is called an HTTP session. And uh, the first page in Fiddler is called Web Sessions, the main page, I should say. And it shows you some information about the traffic, all the traffic that's going through Fiddler. So if we bring up Fiddler, I think I've got some filters set up here. Yeah, damn it. Uh, So let's just browse. Uh, I'll just refresh this page to get something. And we can see the traffic is going through Fiddler now. So it shows you a fair bit of information about what's going on there. It shows you the HTTP response code, the protocol, which is usually, usually HTTP. It shows you the host, the URL caching headers, and the content type header, and the size of the body, and the process that that's originated that traffic. You can also set up some comments there if you want to. You can say, hey, this is the Fiddler side. I'll show you why that comment could be useful in a sec. So that's basically the web sessions page, which is the main page in Fiddler. When you've got some sessions in your web session capture, what you can do, you can actually compare the traffic. So if I do a control F5 on this guy again, I can see that this has appeared here again, this one. So I can choose, select these two sessions and right click and say compare. And it's going to show the difference between these two sessions in a compare tool. Now we can set up this compare tool. It, it doesn't have to be win merge. It's by default win merge, but you can set, set it up in registry to pick up whatever tool that, that's your preference. It's very useful when you've got a working traffic and a non-working traffic. That'll show you how you can capture it in a sec. And that way, you can compare the two traffic to see what the difference between the two is and how you can fix it. This is very useful when you want to compare two HTTP sessions with each other, but you can't really compare two traffic profiles with each other using that 
comparison to what you can do, there is a traffic differ extension in Fiddler website that you can download. And using that, you can compare two complete HTTP traffic. Let's have a look at the statistics page, which is this guy on the right-hand side. So when you select a session in the web sessions page, it shows you some information about that session, like this is, a, this is one request, the bytes sent in that request is this much, this many bytes were sent, this much of it was headers, and this much of it was bodies. These many bytes were received, out of which this much was headers and this much was body. The first request started there. But it's, it's not that useful when you select one session there. It's very useful when you choose more than one. So it shows you that you've chosen, you've selected 33 sessions. This many bytes were sent, out of which this much was header and no body because we don't have any HTTP posts. So HTTP requests don't have any body if, you don't, if you're not posting anything. And these many bytes were received out of which this much was header and this much was body. It also shows you that this was when the first request started and this is when the last response ended. It also breaks down the response codes by, uh, the traffic by the response code, like there were 27 200s and 4 304s and 1 204 and 1302, and it shows you the content, breaks down the content by the content type. You can also visualize this bit of it using this show chart here that shows you that this much of it was PNG, this much JavaScript header plane. This is really useful if you want to see why your website is running slowly to see what is actually going on on your wire. If you're a command prompt guy like I am, uh, you like your command prompts and shortcuts, so there is, a, there is a small box down the bottom of web sessions page here that you can use to fire some commands to Fiddler. There are quite a lot of useful commands there, and if you want to get the, get the complete list, you don't have to memorize it or see it from my slides. You just type help in this box here, and it takes you to the Fiddler quick exec page, if it does. To get to this, to set the focus on this guy, just a shortcut, you can use Alt-Q, and it sets it. Sets it. If you're not seeing Fiddler, just showing some shortcut while that's loading, you can use Control Alt F and brings up Fiddler, and then you can do Alt Q to set the focus on this guy. And then you've got some commands here that you can see in the help page. There are quite a few of them, and some of them are actually quite useful. The thing with this quick exec box is that a lot of the commands that you can issue to this box are actually available through menus and uh, drop down boxes, uh, menu context menus. Some of the useful ones is that if I want to get two or four status codes, it selects all the two or fours. Well, there is only one, not very useful. I'll just choose 200s. Or I could say, get me all the images. There are also a fair bit of, there is also a fair bit of support for breakpoints. So if you want to set a breakpoint, you can set some breakpoints through a quick exec box, and if you type BP there, it shows you a set of breakpoint commands that we'll get to in a second. So quite handy, if you want to start and stop Fiddler, you can type in start there, and stop there, start and stops it. I'll just start it back again. Inspectors allow you to, we mentioned that proxies, HTTP proxies are very useful in visualizing the HTTP uh, communication, and inspectors are there in Fiddler that allow you to visualize the request and response. There, is a, there, are, there are quite a few inspectors built into Fiddler, and you can actually download some <coughs> extensions like Syntax Viewer, which is quite handy. So there are quite a lot of them. Let's have a look at them. So inspectors are here in this tab here, so you can pick a traffic and click here and show the traffic, uh, the inspectors of that particular session. Uh, I don't really do it that way. I usually just double click on something and it takes me to the appropriate page. So for an image, for example, the appropriate page would be for the request, which is on the top, the headers, and for the response, it takes me to the image view that shows the image if there is something there. So let's go through some of the more useful ones. The top box is for 
HTTP requests, and the bottom one is for the HTTP response. The headers part shows you all the headers. So this is your request line that we talked about earlier, and these are your header lines. And then on the bottom, you can see this is the response header, and these are this is your response status code, and these are your headers. You can also have a look at the text view of that if you've got anything there. For requests, we don't have anything. Well, let me just choose something more useful, maybe the Fiddler traffic that has got something useful in it. All right, so if you look at it, there is nothing there for the HTTP request, but the HTTP response has got a fair bit of info, which is the Fiddler web page. On the syntax view, I can see it in a more useful and colored way. And then we've got the web view, which kind of shows the HTML page to you. Uh, on the request side of it, if you're posting a web form, you can see the information in the web forms. If you're sending any cookies, you can see the cookies here. If you want to see the raw HTTP request or raw HTTP response, you can have a look at that there. If you have any AJAX requests, you can see the requests here and the responses appearing here. We'll have a look at some of this in the upcoming slides. HTTPS traffic decryption. So Fiddler can decrypt HTTPS traffic using a hacking method called man-in-the-middle attack. For those of you who don't know how it looks like, it kind of looks like this, in a way. <laughs> not, not quite, but it's very similar, I promise. <laughs> so the client sends a request to a server, an HTTP request, and in response, it gets an HTTP response back. Now, when we've got something in the middle, which is man-in-the-middle, the client thinks it's still communicating to the server, but it's actually sending the request to, a, to another agent in the middle, which is man in the middle. Man in the middle can make any modification to that and forward the request to the server, and server thinks that it's returning the response to the client, but it's actually returning it to the man in the middle, and that changes and forwards the traffic back to the client. So let's have a look at how we can set up HTTPS decryption in Fiddler. By default, Fiddler doesn't decrypt HTTPS traffic, so you have to set it up. If you go to Tools, Fiddler Options, HTTPS, by default, Fiddler captures HTTP, HTTPS connects, but if you want to decrypt the actual traffic, you have to tick this checkbox. All the thing is that, oh, let me just remove some of this. I should have set this up before, but that's all right. Now if I can only find Fiddler back, so here it is. All right, when you tick this checkbox, it pops up this message that says, hey, we're generating a unique root certificate uh, to put in your uh, certificate store. It's doing that because it's sitting between the client and the server. And if it wants to decrypt the communication, it has to, the client has to encrypt the communication, the HTTP, HTTP request, using a certificate that Fielder knows about. So it creates and inserts this certificate into your personal store that client uses to encrypt the communication. And then it knows the private key so it can actually decrypt the communication. So if you say yes here, then Windows says, hey, someone is trying to install a certificate somewhere. Are you happy to do it? And we say, yeah, yeah, we're happy. All right, so let's have a look at that certificate there to see where it's installed and what it's doing. So this is the certificate here. So you can see that Fiddler has inserted the certificate into my personal store. It's also inserted a very similar one, the same one, into the trusted root. So that's the certificate that the client uses to encrypt the data. So that's how Fiddler gets to decrypt the HTTPS connection. I'm not going to go through a demo for that because it's going to look exactly like the HTTP traffic. You just have to be able to enable and disable it. And if you want to remove, if you don't want to decrypt it, you just untick this checkbox. If you want to remove the interception certificates, you can just click this guy and it removes that certificate from your certificate store. All right, changing the traffic on the fly. Because Fiddler is sitting in the middle, it, can, it gets, a, gets to see the HTTP, HTTP request and the response. So it can modify the request and response. All, after all, Fiddler is the man in the middle, right? So let's have a look at the demo. So how does Fiddler get to change the request and response on the fly? To do that, we have to set up some breakpoints. So when the request is sent, we get to, to, check, to see the traffic and change it. There are a few ways you can set breakpoints in Fiddler. One is this hidden box down here that you can click on. If you click on it, it sets a breakpoint on all, uh, all requests. If you click on it again, it sets a breakpoint on all incoming traffic, all HTTPS responses. And if you click it again, it removes them all. The same goes here. 
you get a very similar thing through, through menus, before requests, after responses, which does the very similar thing to what we just did. And you get to set some breakpoints through filters that we'll have a look at near the end of the session. So let's set up some breakpoints there. I'm a big fan of this guy here, so I just do BP. It shows me how I can set a breakpoint. For requests, I usually use BPU that sets a breakpoint on URIs. All right, so if you wanna practice with Fiddler, it's got a sandbox that you can bring up and play with it. Uh, just don't use IE if that's okay. Well, it works the same way in Chrome and IE just. All right, so this is a sandbox. This is my favorite one. It's a shopping cart example. It shows you a kind of a shopping cart that you can go and check out a few items into. So let's, without setting any breakpoints, see how it works. So I check out one item and it says, hey, you checked out one of these tablets and the value of one is this much and you've checked out one, so this is how much you get to pay. So let's set a breakpoint there and see what we can do. So the traffic is actually this guy, the checkout ASP. So I'll just set a breakpoint on this guy. And you can actually do control I if you choose something when, you, when you're in the quick exec box. You can do control I and copies the traffic, copies the URI down, or you can just go here and say copy just URL and come down here and paste it. Alternatively, as I said, just control I on it and it copies it, copies it down. So we set up a breakpoint on that URL and it shows it in this status bar down here. Let's do that again. Let's have a look at this checkout. So if I check out again, the request is sent. Well, it's not quite sent, but it's captured, kind of hit a breakpoint in Fiddler. Now we can see the entire request here. This is the text view. These are the headers that I'm sending to the server. I haven't sent it yet. And this is the web form that I'm posting. So instead of this much, I'm actually happy to pay only $10. <laughs> and I want to buy 100 instead of one and I run to completion. So let's have a look at this guy. So say, hey, you bought 100 tablets for the price of $10 each, so you get to pay 1,000 bucks. That's not a bad deal. <laughs> All right, that's for requests. Let's change the response. So if you wanna clear your breakpoints, you can just issue the same command without any parameters, and it clears your breakpoints. Let's set a breakpoint on the response of that URI. So I've got this URI, say BP after, control I, all right, I've got that there. Let's issue that command again and see what we can do. Check out. Now, the request is now sent. If you have a look at this guide, you can see that it's stopped in the response. The request is sent, so there is nothing I can change here. Everything is read-only. I can't change the cookies. I can't change anything there. The request is sent. What I get to change is the response because it hasn't been returned to the client yet. So I'm just going to go to syntax view, the body. I'm just gonna go to something like that and then run it. So I've, I've got to change the HTML body of the response on the fly. It's not just a body that you can change, you can change whatever you want. So let's just set up, run it again. And this time instead of the body, I go and set the cookie there. Just go set cookie name equals my name. I run it to completion. So the body is the same, but if I go and have a look at my cookies in Chrome, Fiddler, I've got this cookie there. So you can change all the traffic. You can change everything about the HTTP request and everything about the HTTP response using Fiddler. So why would you want to do that? There are a few things that you can do with that. For example, you can test your JavaScript code without changing your server code. You want to see if your JavaScript handles some tricky situations. You change your traffic on the fly, send some dodgy responses back to the client to see if your JavaScript code ha can handle that. You can test your website for security holes to make sure that some other hacker that using Fiddler cannot actually hack your website. You can troubleshoot your third-party web clients. If you've got a web client that you don't know how it works and you haven't written it, if you've got a web server or a website that that client is using, what you can do is you can, if that's crashing, this is what happened to me a while back. I had a third-party client written in Power Builder. And um, 
I had this web server, and every now and then the client was crashing, so I set up some breakpoints and changed the traffic until I, I realized what was wrong with the client. So we got to kind of send that back to them. You can do the same thing with a third-party web service. There are quite a few things that you can do, but these are some of the examples. Autoresponder. So using autoresponder because Fiddler is sitting in the middle, right? So it can use, it can fake your web server. You can respond to the HTTP requests on the fly without hitting the web server. So let's have a look at that guy. So you know how in the beginning of the session I was going to google.com and it was redirecting me to Bing? That's not what QUT did, that's what Fiddler did. So I've got some autoresponder rules here that says, hey, if there is any URI request that somehow partially matches google.com, respond with this guy. And if you have a look at this guy, it's a redirect. It says, send a 302 redirect back and redirect the client to this location. So let's have a look at how that works. I'm not going to clear this traffic because I'm going to need it. So I apologize for the noisy traffic there. So let's go to, I'll just go Fiddler like I did before, right? So if you look at here, you can see that someone has put some Fiddler thing here and the response, and we now know how to see that. In the request to get blah, we've got a redirect 302 to Bing. And the next thing that the browser does says, hey, I know what to do with that. Let's send a request to Bing. And it does that, and it gets a 200 back. Now, this guy on the top, of course, Bing doesn't do that, right? So I've got a, another bit of autoresponder rule here that says, if someone asks for Bing, return this response. And the response, I'll fiddle with it and put, please kindly use Bing on these premises. So I can change the whole traffic on the fly using autoresponder. Now, how can you set up something like that? So by default, autoresponder is disabled. If you want to enable it, you just go to autoresponder tab and click on this guy that enables it. And you can set up some rules there. You can say that, hey, if someone asks for Bing or something, then do something else. It's quite erroneous to do it by hand, and you could very easily get it wrong. So the easier way to do that is like this. Let's set up something. If someone goes to, if there is a request to Fiddler, just drag and drop that guy into here and shows you the URL and the session that it's going to return. So what you can do there, you can go and edit the response and do whatever you want with it. You can go, if you went to there, the H2, after that, put another H2 that says, maybe like this, like this, and save it. And then the next time you go to Fiddler Sandbox, you hopefully get to see that guy. I'm actually going to change this just in case. Uh, I can just copy this to not get it wrong. All right. Let's put that up there. And you get to see that. So it's applied to every single traffic sent through the wire. Unlike uh, breakpoints that you get to fiddle on the fly. So you have, with breakpoints, you have to change the traffic every time the breakpoint hit, is hit. With other responder, you can just change it on the fly. So what are some of the typical uses of autoresponder? If you want to see how a JavaScript that's not running on your website would react on your website, you can change your JavaScript code on the fly or a CSS file on the fly and then set an autoresponder uh, rule that says, anytime my website asks for this CSS, return this one in return. So you can see how your website would look like using a different CSS or how it would behave using a different JavaScript. You can replace an entire traffic as we saw earlier you can force a redirection, as we saw. And uh, you can actually download the entire internet and use it locally and never pay for internet again. Oh, let me just keep track of time. Oh. All right. So Request Builder is the counterpart of Autoresponder. With Request Builder, you can fake a web client where Autoresponder could fake a web server. So Fiddler can do that, of course, because it's the man in the middle. Now I got you there. It's not that photo. It's actually not because Fiddler is the man in the middle. With Request Builder, Fiddler is the initiator. So the HTTP request is initiated in the Fiddler, and the response is returned only to Fiddler, so it doesn't return anything anywhere. 
it sends a request and it receives a response. It's not doing that because it's a man in the middle. So what you can use Request Builder for is to avoid coding HTML pages and test clients. If you have a website and uh, you want to see, I don't know, you test some web server or something that, that's running using HTTP, then you can bring up Request Builder and see how it works instead of writing an HTML page or a test client. So let's quickly have a look at Request Builder. As we said before, a request is composed of a request line, which is this guy. It's got a HTTP verb. It's got the host and it's got the HTTP version. Then you get to set up some of the headers. And if you're posting something somewhere, you get to use the request body there. If you don't want to use this form like, you can use the raw version and copy your entire HTTP request there. And what you do is just click execute and it sends that request. So let's just do a request on, if I can get this guy, uh, there you go. I'll just do a request on, say, I don't know, I do a post. So if I can find. Let's find the post there. Okay, so this is a post. I just drag and drop this guy into Request Builder and it creates a request for me. So I can go and change this if I want to. So this is the, as mentioned before, this is the request line, these are the headers. This is the black line and this is the body. You can also have a look at the pause version and change it on the fly if you want to. And what it does, if you send this guy, it's gonna run and then it returns some response to, ah, oh, I didn't send ret return a response because people still got that breakpoint there. So I'll just go, go and it resumes that and it returns the response back. Let's have a look at the filters. Filters are there. They allow you to filter and flag traffic and do some lightweight modifications. Let's have a look at them. Um, where is it? Filters. So if you want to set up some filters, you can just tick this box and it says, it's actually classified very nicely in different categories. So if you want to filter by host, you can say only show me the intranet traffic or show me internet traffic. You can say, only show me traffic from this website, or don't show me traffic from this website. You can say, only show me traffic from this client process. Only show me traffic if the header has got something like that in it. Only, you can hide some traffic based on response status codes. You can show and hide traffic based on response types and sizes. Size. You can show and flag traffic using response headers. What's very useful in this filter that we don't have anywhere else in Fiddler is these two guys. You can set breakpoint on HTTP posts that you don't get to do anywhere else. So if you tick this box, it stops on all the HTTP posts and it let all the gets and other verbs, other verbs through. You can also say break on HTTP, XML HTTP requests, which stops on AJAX requests. So that could be very useful. I'm not gonna go through filters because it's quite intuitive and we're kind of running out of time, so. You can use filters to clean up your web sessions page. Why would you want to do that? Because you're running Fiddler, for example, on a high traffic server, and a lot is going on through your web session. So you can set up Fiddler and say, hey, just show me the traffic that returns 500 status code. That way you get to see what's going on with your, what's going wrong with your website. You can filter out some status codes. You can filter out some traffic from some URLs. So yeah, it could be very handy in cases when you have a lot of traffic going through your filter app. So we had a look at the Fiddler features now. We'll go through Fiddler Core and Fiddler Cap. The proxy functionality provided by Fiddler is in a bit of code in the Fiddler code base. Eric has extracted that functionality and put it into a .NET 2.0 library. It's called it Fiddler Core. Fiddler itself is actually not using Fiddler Core, but the code that's there is the basis for Fiddler Core. What you can do, that Fiddler Core is a, is a library, .NET 2.0 library, that you can use in your app. So if you've got some functionality, some requirements rather similar to what Fiddler does, you can just reference that library and use it the way Fiddler does. One of the better applications I've seen written using Fiddler Core is Fiddler Cap. 
it's been deployable, so you don't have to install it anywhere. It's a handy tool for production support. So let's have a look at it. So if I bring up Fiddler Cap, let's see where Fiddler looks a bit alien to end users and a bit complicated. Fiddler Cap is a very simple application with a very simple UI. What you can do, so you've got a website that's not working in production and your users are whinging about it, so you send them the Fiddler Cap or the link to Fiddler Cap. They go and download it. It's got only three buttons in a way on it. Say, start capture, and you search for something. Ah, damn it. <laughs> I should have disabled that other responder. <laughs> All right, you don't search for it using this, you disable this guy and then go and search for it. Some tests, it brings up something. <coughs> then you have a look at your filler core. You stop the capture, so you've got whatever you wanted from that session, which is shown here. What you can do, you can also say, hey, add a snapshot to this as well because I want to show what's happened, what exactly happened. You can add some comments there. Something like that. And then you save the capture. I'll just save it somewhere on my RAM disk and call it something. And then I'll go there and open it up in Fiddler. I'm not going to clear up the traffic that I had before because I may need it. So this is, well, let's clear it up. It's a bit too much there. So when you open it up, you see exactly what your users saw when they were running Fiddler Cap. So this is all they ran, and they went to Google and searched for it, and then they were redirected to Bing for some reason. You also get to see the user comments that they put in. You can also see the image that they've attached. So it's quite handy if you've got some bugs in production and your IT support is not allowing you to run Fiddler on the production or you, do, you don't even know where the production is running, you can just send a link to Fiddler Cap and let your users capture the traffic and send it to you. So you can get to see in your convenience what's going on on the server. A quick summary of what we covered. If you want to watch a traffic using Fiddler, you can see it in web sessions. If you want to compare two sessions, you can use web sessions, compare, choose two sessions, and then right click and compare. If you want to run some commands, go, go to quick exec box. If you want to see what commands are available, you can type in help in quick exec box. If you want to inspect your requests and responses, you can use Fiddler inspectors. If you want to change the traffic on the fly, you can set breakpoints and then using, using inspectors change the <coughs> request and response. If you want to return an HTTPS response locally, you can use other responder. If you want to make an HTTPS request, you can use request builder. If you want to filter and flag sessions, you can use filters. And if you want to use Fiddler for your end users, or a cut down version of filter, Fiddler for your end users, you can send them Fiddler cap. Uh, how much time have we got left? There's plenty. I'll just do a quick tour of remaining features of Fiddler. We've seen a lot, pretty much all the major features in Fiddler are now covered. There are a few there that we haven't covered. If you want to, by default, when you run Fiddler, it's capturing the traffic. If you want to start or stop capturing, you can click here, starts it, click it again, stops it. You can also say start here, well, if you type it properly, starts it. If you stop here, it stops. You can do it in the file, capture traffic, and capture traffic. So it does the same thing. If you want to filter your traffic, not from all processes, but from a web browser, you can say only show me traffic from web browsers, or don't show me traffic from web browsers, or don't show me anything at all. I don't know why, would you, why you would do that, but anyway. You can set breakpoints on requests and responses as we saw before. This guy here is showing you how many sessions you've got in your web sessions tab, and this guy shows you the last command that you've run. You can add comment, as mentioned before, to a session, and that's useful to communicate. If you want to store your traffic and send it to someone else, you can actually set some comment and send it to them. You can load an archive that's been saved. You can save your current sessions. You can only save the requests. You can only save the responses. If you right-click on this guy, you can copy the URL of a session, or you can, you can only copy a column. You can copy headers only. You can copy summaries or the entire session. 
The same goes for save. You can save requests, you can save responses, you can save selected sessions, you can select a few sessions and save them all. Same applies. You can replay a traffic. So if you've got, it's very much like request, using request builder, you can just say, right click on something and reissue the request again. And it's gonna go and reissue the request again. If you wanna clean up the traffic, you can do it through this guy and remove all, or you can select this guy and do control X, does the same thing. If you've got some breakpoints hit, and that's gonna be hard because I don't have anything, so let's just go to filter website and go to this guy. So, oh, I wasn't capturing. <laughs> I'll do that again. And now I've got some filters, haven't I? Getting me there. Yeah, if you've got some breakpoints hit and you don't wanna do anything with the traffic, you can either click this button that res resumes all the traffic or you can just go here and say go. Does the same thing. You can stream traffic. Because Fiddler is sitting in the middle, it actually captures the entire request and then passes it on. And when it receives the response, it does the same thing. It gets the entire response and then passes it on. What you can do, you can stream it. You can say, yeah, I don't want to do that. Just pick on the traffic, but let it go through. When, you do, when you're doing that, you can't set any breakpoints because you can't stop it in a point. So you have to, if you're setting breakpoints and change the traffic, you can stream. When you go to a... Let's go to something, I don't know. I don't know which website actually does encode the traffic. Let's have a look and see if Yahoo does. No, it doesn't. So you've got some transformers there. If your website is actually compressing, you can go to these transformers and say no compression, otherwise your traffic is gonna look kind of cryptic too. You can Filter, pro filter traffic using a, for a particular process. So you click this guy and hold your mouse down and then take it whatever you want and leave it. And it says, I'm gonna capture traffic only from this process in Chrome, which is one of the tabs. Finding fiddler, fiddler is actually a very useful feature. You can find in requests and responses, you can find in headers and bodies, you can say, nah, only find in requests or only find in responses or URLs only. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if you've got a lot going on and if you're looking for some particular traffic, you can just do control F there, bring this up and you can search for what you're looking for. That is pretty much it. There are some rules there, so you can Filter script is how, it's where all the rules are set up. So you can go there and actually add some scripts there. For example, it's got these two rules here that you can say, hey, change any traffic going through Fiddler, change it to look as if it's going through IE9. So you can test how your server, server behaves if it receives any traffic from IE9 or Chrome or whatever. So these rules are set here. So you can go and create new, new rules here. It's written using a language called javascript.net whatever that is. And uh, you've got a few hooks there. So when, you, when Fiddler boots up, you can actually write some code to do something. When it's shutting down, you can write some code to do something. And uh, before every request, it does a few things. It does a few things before response. And then these are your commands that you can run down here, so you can actually create commands there. You can, if you know JavaScript.net by any chance, you can go and create new commands there. What else we've got there? We had a look at Fiddler options, Vinonet options, we had a look at sandboxes. So that's pretty much it for Fiddler features. Let's have a look at, get rid of this guy. Fiddler comes with a lot of extensions. It's very extensible and uh, you can write your extensions on it or you can use some of the extensions that are there. Syntax Viewer is a very nice one. So if you wanna find the extensions, you just go to the Fiddler website, to show you where you can get it from. 
These are the add-ons. It shows you all, this, all the available extensions and what they do and what they look like. Syntax Viewer is a good one. If you're doing WCF using HTTP binding, you can use WCF binary inspector. As mentioned before, if you've got two traffic and you want to compare the two, you can use traffic differ. There is a gallery extension that allows you to, that shows you all the images that you've captured in, a, in an HTTP session. There is Nextpert performance report generator that does performance monitoring for your website, and there is Stress Stimulus that does load testing, but Stress Stimulus is actually a paid product. But. So that's pretty much all from me. Uh, if you've got any questions or anything, feel free to shoot. By the way, these are the tutorials that I was talking about. If you want to, everything that I mentioned on in this session are available here and a bit more. And if you've got any questions, just feel free to send me an email or tweet. That's I think that's the end of it. <laughs> if you've got any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you.